You know, I find it ironic that wine was invented before the wheel. Those two inventions changed lives forever. <laughs> There's an invention that changed mine, and it came from a chimpanzee. I was in Norman, Oklahoma, at the Lemon Foundation, under the direction of Dr. Roger Fouts. He's the one on the left. <laughs> I was there to teach chimpanzees sign language. All of a sudden, one of the graduate students called us over to witness Nim create a new sign. By the time we got there, Nim was signing nut lotion, nut lotion. Before we could analyze what he was talking about, what he meant, he started signing berry lotion, berry lotion. One of the grad students instinctively reached over, grabbed her yogurt, put some fruit in it, gave it to Nim, and he was totally satisfied. I was amazed. I had just witnessed Nim invent signs to communicate and solve his problem. But after that, I went on. I chose a career, got married, had a couple of kids. And at the age of 29, I thought I was a senior management consultant. But my life was about to change. You see, my father knew he was an inventor. He called himself an idea man. And once at a party, he was talking about this article he read about a woman who was attacked through an open window. Now, I knew he was thinking about my grandmother at the time. She lived alone, and she loved to leave the window open a little bit to get a little cool night's air. So he leaned over to me and he said, how do we protect an open door or an open window? Now, I was traveling around North America at the time, and I thought I would stop in some place, smack down some money, buy a device, give it to my dad, problem solved. But about a year later, we were sitting together, and I said, hey, Dad, remember that question you asked me about open doors and windows? I couldn't find anything. He said, I know. We have to invent something. Working day to day with my dad, I loved my dad, but working together with him, I thought I was helping him. He was helping me. He helped define who I was. I had all these talents and blessings, but they didn't connect. Well, they connected with the invention. What we ended up inventing was portable, wireless, unique ID security used all over the world to save millions of lives. I then went on to invent private information to your cell phone, an infant respiratory rate monitor for developing countries, and recently, I reinvented the video surveillance camera for autonomous vehicles. Many of those inventions I was not the master of. But I'd like to share with you a conversations I've had with hundreds of inventors, the four stages of invention. The first is ideas, the exchange of thoughts, conversations that lead to an action. Art the application of reality by technique, my definition for sketching, drawing, molding, and making, your ideas. Invention, the creation of a process, product, or device that's new. And patent, recognition by a government authority that you have created something new and not known before. So I'd like to share the invention for the infant respiratory rate monitor. I was at an impromptu meeting with a large NGO working with UNICEF, USAID, UKAID, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization. By the way, that's me at the World Health Organization uh, announcing the infant respiratory rate monitor. Later that night, we uh, showed movies on my forehead. <laughs> Swedish movies. Um, but I was demonstrating the security system to their staff, and I was showing them how it could be used for equipment, for pharmaceuticals, for staff, but they didn't see any value. So falling back on my consulting years, I said, what in your day-to-day -day life is the biggest pain? Without hesitation, someone said, infant pneumonia. It kills two million babies every year. That's big. Okay, 
but I needed some more information. I said, could you give me an idea of what infant pneumonia looks like? And she held out her hand and she started doing this. She said, tachypnea, rapid breath movement. And I grabbed one of my sensors and I put it in her hand and it immediately started to count the respiratory rate motion. I said, I can do that. She said, well, the World Health Organization demands we do it in one minute. Can you do it in a minute? I said, yes, I can do that. So I took my sensor, the latest high grade, hospital grade respiratory rate monitor and the most portable respiratory rate monitor to test. They all failed, everything. They all failed the one minute test. But I was working with this portable unit and my partner's daughter came in from exercising. We had an exercise facility next to our office. And I said, hey, put this on, press start, let me get your respiratory rate. She did, but I thought she wiggled. So I said, do it again. So she did. Within 30 seconds, I had two different respiratory rates. I had a respiratory rate of 38 and 24. Now, the percentage of error within that is about 30 to 50%. That means when you're diagnosing pneumonia and you give somebody an antibiotic, you potentially could be building antibiotics, pneumonia that's resistant to antibiotics. That's how serious it is. But I, now I had enough information. I had a problem. Now I could become artful. So what I did was I grabbed a sensor to count respiratory rate. I grabbed another sensor that we invented for baby wiggle. The invention became a system, a process, a device to measure respiratory rate and eliminate the baby wiggle. The patent recognized that we had invented a sensor to detect baby wiggle that nobody else had done. You know, for, for me, there's two patron saints for inventors. There's Nikola Tesla and Hedy Lamarr. Nikola Tesla invented alternating current, AC. It's in our homes, it's the plug we put our stuff into. And Nikola Tesla knew electricity intimately so well that he knew he could take a magnet and alternate the polarity of the wire to push electricity for miles. The other guy was doing direct current DC and it would only go a few hundred feet. Remember in school when you tried to put two magnets together that were the north or the south, but they were the same and they would repel each other, but the opposites attracted? Nikola Tesla knew that. Alternating current AC is a brilliant, brilliant invention. But I identify with Hedy Lamarr. She was beautiful and talented. <laughs> All right, more importantly for me, she knew that she was more than the talents that Hollywood was recognizing. And one day she sat at a piano looking at a score of music, like she had done a thousand times, but today it was different. Today, World War II was raging in Europe, and she sat and she looked at a sheet of music for the first time anew and noticed that the words to the song ran ac across the page in a line, but the notes bounced up and down. She started to say to herself, hey, if you know the note pattern, and I know the note pattern, but nobody else knows the note pattern, we could send a secret message. <laughs> Turns out she was right. What she ended up inventing was frequency hopping. It's used today to encrypt cellular, satellite, all forms of communication. What she did was elegantly brilliant. It was a magnificent patent. In fact, inventors like Tesla and Lamar come from all walks of life. That means invention is in us. It's part of us. It has to be. The guy or the girl that invented the needle and thread didn't go to engineering school. They didn't do it by committee. Something happened that caused a flux of ideas that started the molding, making, designing, framing of the needle and thread something that predated the wheel.
In prehistoric times, that was so revolutionary that they had to whip out their phone and tweet everyone. <laughs> I'm kidding. But eventually societies... Well, I know you're... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but eventually... Eventually, societies became to understand and, and value the inventor. In ancient Greece, around 500 BCE, that's roughly 2,500 years ago, in now southern Italy, in this little town called Sybaris, archaeologists found these words. Encouragement was held out to all who should discover any new refinement in luxury, the profits arising from which were secured to the inventor by patent for the space of a year. Now, moving forward roughly a couple thousand years to our Constitution in America, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their writings and discoverings. By declaring those words in our Constitution, we brought immigrants from all over the world. They brought with them their intuition, their experiences, and their inventions, sparking America's progress even till today. Now, should our ancient Greeks and our forefathers be right, there's approximately seven billion people in the planet that could reinvent the world one invention at a time. My short years on this planet, I've invented in many different fields I was not an expert in. Before man's knowable world, we invented politics, science, religion, and math. Collectively, that means that you and I can solve the problems facing mankind. Inventiveness is inside you. In fact, I think it's genetic. My grandfather was an inventor. My father was an inventor. I'm an inventor. My two children are inventors, and I suspect my grandchildren will be inventors as well. You could say invention runs in my family. It practically gallops. <laughs> but I think invention is inside you and your family. Let's take a moment right now. Think of you, everybody. Think of the biggest problem you and mankind face today. Go ahead, take a moment. I'll wait. I mean, you got it? You got it, okay. Now think of the solution. Did you find it? Do you have it? I know, we have to invent something. Wherever we find ourselves, in the past, in the present, or in the future, on this planet or any other, we take with us something divine, the act of invention. Thank you.